It's a great privilege to be here at Southern. I'm very grateful for the invitation, uh, especially to give these Gein's lectures. Um, all I can say is that I'm, because I'm so flattered, I hope you're not completely disappointed by the end. If you're all sleeping peacefully by uh, the time I get to my conclusion, then I'll sneak out quietly and uh, we don't need to worry about the other lectures. The, the theme of these lectures is the wonderful subject of the pre-existence of Christ. That is the Son of God's life in eternity with the Father before his incarnation. And this has for, for some time been a very controversial subject, both among systematic theologians and amongst biblical scholars. Uh, in the 70s, in the 1970s in particular in Britain, you may have heard of the myth of God incarnate controversy, which provoked a great storm. Uh, in recent years, uh, among systematic theologians like uh, Karl Josef Kuschel in Germany, a, Catholic, a liberal Catholic scholar, has written a large book uh, overturning the old idea of pre-existence. And similarly, the very influential uh, American theologian Robert Jensen has recently written uh, a critique of the traditional conception of pre-existence. So, uh, on the theological side, it's very controversial. Similarly, among biblical scholars, New Testament scholars often argue that the concept of Christ's pre-existence is one which is very late in the New Testament, only emerged towards the end of the first century, uh, towards the end of the New Testament period, and is in any case quite marginal in the New Testament, not attested very widely in it, and so of only marginal significance. It's this kind of discussion that provoked me to write my current book on pre-existence, and the aim of it is to argue that pr the pre-existence of Christ comes not only in Paul's letters, not only in John's Gospel, not only in Hebrews, but also in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospel. And that's the controversial element of the book, uh, to show that the pre-existence of Christ, in particular, can be seen in the I have come sayings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospel, in those first three Gospels. So, part one what I want to talk about first is the current and dominant scholarly paradigm that I'm kind of arguing against. I mentioned that uh, New Testament scholars regard the pre-existence of Christ as a marginal phenomenon in the New Testament and a late historical development in New Testament times. <clears throat> and that's essentially based on a certain understanding of the development of the person of Christ in that first century, on the development of earliest Christology. So in the beginnings of the story of Christianity, the narrative goes something like this. In either a few years BC or a few years AD, Jesus of Nazareth was, was born and he joined a reform movement within Ju Judaism that was headed by someone called John, famous for his baptizing, to whom Jesus, this Jesus was probably related. Eventually, in the course of the development of this movement, Jesus actually emerged as the leader, as greater than John, and was seen by himself and by his disciples as a prophet, perhaps even the great eschatological prophet of the end times. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, chose disciples who were to form the nucleus of uh, restored Israel, and uh, nevertheless, his popularity meant that he, the movement had to be forcibly suppressed, both because of and uh, despite this popularity. The, the suppression of the movement led to the execution of this Jesus, uh, and uh, staggeringly, though, certain members of the Jesus movement claimed after his death to have seen visions of him. This, in conjunction with certain complications around the situation with the tomb, led them to proclaim him as resurrected and as Messiah, um, uh, a move that had not been taken before his death, but which was the product of these resurrection appearances. In due course, uh, further on in the, uh, in, in the succeeding decades, he was viewed as a semi-divine figure, as someone who even inhabited the, uh, Christian, meeting, uh, the Christian meetings. He was sensed as, as present in these early Christian uh, worship sessions and uh, then was proclaimed as a semi-divine Lord figure. A few de decades later on still, particularly in the community of another certain John, John the Evangelist, he was regarded not only as a prophet, not only as Messiah, not only as a semi-divine Lord figure, but as the incarnation of God himself, having been in the beginning with the Father and now incarnate as the Son. 
So, John's Gospel represents the full flowering of Christian, uh, Christological development in New Testament times. It comes right at the end of the process. By contrast, according to this scholarly paradigm, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke's Gospels, called the synoptic Gospels because they're, they're, there are a lot of parallels between them, these Gospels kind of cut, um, give you a snapshot of this development as it's midway through. It uh, gives you a picture of Jesus when he's reached the stage of having been regarded as Messiah, but before you get to the stage of him being God incarnate. Now, this is a little bit of uh, an artificial summary, but it nevertheless captures the main picture of the uh, current scholarly paradigm. A lot of scholars would uh, say that it's a bit more messy than that, um, particularly with Paul, but for the sake of time, I've given you this brief schematic summary. Let me give you three reasons initially why I'm suspicious of this paradigm. So uh, if if you're following on the handout, you've had the paradigm, now you're having the problems. First then, a point which I'll just make very briefly, that much scholarship has seriously underestimated the historical reliability of John's Gospel. The majority of scholars, as I've implied in the uh, outline of the scholarly paradigm, regard sayings of pre-existence and of uh, Jesus referring to himself in divine terms in John's Gospels as a serious anachronism. In other words, when John is writing his Gospel, his own portrait of Jesus, in fact, reflects more of his own thought than of the thought of the historical Jesus. So he's essentially reading back this later developed Christology into the period of Jesus' own lifetime. But I think that a number of uh, conservative scholars in particular have provided compelling reasons for some suspicion of the scholarly paradigm at this point. And I refer you in particular to Craig Blomberg's book, The Historical Reliability of John's Gospel, published in 2001. Uh, uh, An excellent statement, uh, in particular on the authorship of John's Gospel. He shows how on internal grounds, on the grounds of the evidence from the Gospel itself, and on the grounds of the early witness of the church fathers, uh, there are very good reasons for seeing John the disciple, uh, the original disciple of Jesus, as the author of the gospel. But I'm not going to go into detail at this point on the question of the historical reliability of John, merely to state the point. Second problem, I think that Paul's letters seriously scupper the evolutionary or developmental model of Christology that I outlined above. Paul's letters are, of course, among the earliest documents of the New Testament, and at the same time as being among the earliest, they also give evidence for some of the highest Christology, some of the most exalted pictures of Jesus uh, in the New Testament. And so you can see pre-existence all over the place in those letters of Paul. First of all, active personal pre-existence. I'll uh, explain what I mean by those terms, active personal pre-existence, as we go through. Starting off with Philippians 2, Philippians 2 is one place where a number of scholars find it particularly difficult to avoid the obvious implications of pre-existence. To quote verses 6 to 8 here, which I've printed on your handouts, this is Jesus Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not reckon equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant coming in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So there are two key elements for my sort of discussion of pre-existence in this statement. First is the dramatic movement in the transition that we see in this, uh, according to some people, a hymn or a poem, The development, the dramatic movement from Jesus being in the form of God, on the one hand, to taking the form of a servant. Now, people often, if if you've done any exegesis classes on Philippians or or read any commentaries on Philippians, you'll know that there's a lot of debate about what what, what Paul means by Jesus being in the form of God. But the majority view, even now, is that when Paul talks about Jesus being in the form of God, it means form in the sense of the form that reveals reality. It's not form as opposed to reality. Jesus really is in the person of God just as he 